Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through three short but really awesome documents by Simon Carrier. Simon put together that Ilmet in the City, those seven picaresque adventure locations that I covered in a previous video. And uh, when I went to his page on DTRPG, I saw that there were three other pay what you want documents, three other pay what you want adventures. And so I, I checked them out and they are awesome, really, really cool. So I wanted to share them with you guys here and, and recommend that you go check them out. Um, there are three, as I said, the first one is called Under the City, and it's essentially uh, just a bunch of, you know, underneath the city. It, basically, it's tiers going down into the earth, or maybe you could spread them out throughout a city, but they're like, you know, sewer adventures, cave adventures, um, under city adventures. This is seven pages. Each of them is just a one page of the whole level, which is awesome. There's the Great Dwarf Road, which is, as it sounds, like a great dwarf road through the mountains with a bunch of different locations along that road. This one is 11 pages. And then there's Pyramid of the Undying, which is a Lost City fan edit. Now, I've never played Moldvay's The Lost City, um, but I know that there are lots of YouTubers. Uh, Professor Dungeon Master recently did a video, or relatively recently did a video, about him his running The Lost City in just a few sessions. Uh, I think this is similar. Like, this is something that is much shorter than what it looks like The Lost City is, uh, much more streamlined. It's a different kind of tone. It's it's historical. Now that there are some, as he says, uh, he removed some D and D isms. Um, there are still some D and D isms, right? You're still dealing with like a rust monster, and you still have things like that. But it's mostly like fantasy historical, rather than anything else. You're dealing with um, the gods of the Greeks. You're dealing with you know it mentions Alexander the Great and things like that. Uh, so it's it's like you know it's historical fantasy rather than just strictly fantasy. But it's really, really cool. I like this adventure a lot. It's one of those, um, it feels a little funhouse dungeon-y just because it's a pyramid with a bunch of factions and a bunch of monsters in, you know, like 50-some rooms, 60-some rooms. You know, how are they there? There's some explanation given, but if your party is bothered by a lot of that, that's probably not going to be the adventure for you. But, but if it's not, then it's going to be great. And I'll, I'll talk about that more in a minute. But first, let's go through Under the City. Uh, level one is the Gurgler. Uh, and then what I love about it is each of these pages has, I mean, you get everything you need on this one page. This is basically system neutral, right? Because there are some stats, there's some uh, effects, so it's not just like do something like this. But the stats are given in very generic uh, OSR terms. So you could run it for your game of choice, right? Whatever it is. I love what you have here. So you have rumors about this level, right? A D6 level of rumors. The Royal Emerald was stolen a few weeks ago. There's a gang hiding out in the old alchemist shop. Smugglers operate out of the Goose Egg Tavern. Pale figures have been seen in the cemetery. Criminal gangs use the sewers as a highway and the old church is haunted. Now, each of those relates to one of these entrances, basically, or something that's happening down here, right? So you have the D4 encounters, or other D6 encounters, you're most likely to encounter giant rats. Um, you get different entrances. The sewer entrance, the goose egg tavern, the alchemist shop, the family crypt of the old church. So those relate to those rumors. And then you get the description of each of these places. You get the sewer thoroughfare. And a brief description of it. The, the gurgler is room 8. It's basically this um, current that sucks down the water into the level below. And you can get sucked down uh, if you go swimming around in it. But it's a way down to the next level. Uh, there's a uh, you know, blind Betty which is a, uh, <laughs> a giant alligator, um, I think. Yeah, Blind Betty the Albino Alligator, right? The allig alligators in the sewers, that's the old urban legend. Well, there's one down here. And so if you, uh, if you swim around in the water, you're gonna attract her in D4 rounds. Um, you get the Alchemist Workshop, you get some storerooms, you get the basements of the Goose Egg Tavern. Basically, this, is, this would be a way to um, you know, connect a bunch of places on the surface, right? So the players are, are going to the different locations in your city with the Goose Egg Tavern or the Alchemist Workshop, the Old Church. You put those in your world, right? And then you put maybe some rumors about the, uh, the, uh, the sewers down here. And then maybe the players realize that they have um, reasons to go down, whatever it might be, uh, they connect with uh, the Dead Men, right? Which is the, dominant, the city's dominant criminal, criminal enterprise. Um, and uh, you in interact with those those guys, or whatever it is. But then as they go down, they realize that there's more down here than just that. Whatever, whichever reason you've picked for them to go down, there's more down here than that. And it connects to even more of the city and undercity and stuff like that. And you could really build this out into a fun uh, adventure or several adventures. 
because level one turns into level two, King Garibald's Curse, and there are rumors that relate to this level and ways to connect to the level above. As you can see, you can come down the Gurgler, you can go down the steps into the old church. There are different entrances down here. Um, I think that's really, really cool. Three ways, in fact. There's the old church lower basement, which goes to room seven of the first floor. There is the crypt, which goes to room 12 of the first floor, and then there's the Gurgler. So there's three ways, um, as stated, down to this level. And you have you know, the family crypt in the church, but ways of get connecting to the rest of it through room two, four, and then six into five, uh, basically. Now there are two broken sections, right? You can't really get from 10, 11, 12 to one through nine. And that's okay because obviously you're gonna be connected to two different things, right? And I think that's really, really cool. Um, because you can get down to the third level from uh, room 12 and then there are other ways of connecting. So basically, uh, yeah, level eight also has a connection. Room eight has also a connection. So, um, I don't know. I just think this is really cool. You have like essentially a kind of dungeon, but spread out through multiple uh, floors. And like level two has two separate sections that don't connect, but they do connect each to the top and, and uh, level one and level three. That's awesome. I like things like that. And what's going on in each of these floors is kind of cool. Don Pasquale. <laughs> you get the maggot, the man maggots, which is nasty. You could easily connect this. If you guys remember, um, there is the uh, oh, old school essentials uh, adventure anthologies. One of those is the curse of the maggot god. Easily throw that into this level, right? There's just, this is one of the sewers offshoots and it goes to that whole adventure, which also connected to the city above. Very easily connected to that. Or the well of frogs, right? You could easily connect this to that. Adventure, which is another one of those uh, adventures that I've reviewed before. Lots of cool adventures that deal with the Undercity or deal with sewers or things like that. This would fit right in, could fit this into the same sort of campaign that you're running with one of those urban campaigns. If you did um, my take on Trial of the Slime Lord, I think is what it's called, which is that funnel for Shadow Dark that I reviewed, where instead of putting it in the wilderness, you put it in the city. You fit right into this as well. You get the wax men down here too. I think this is a fantastic adventure. Really, really cool. The ideas are awesome. Level three is the skull of Malabranch. The archdemon Malabranch was slain many years ago and fashionable youths are seen visiting a cave outside the city. <laughs> There's fashionable youths down here and I love it. There's a youth fashion table. You roll twice to see what people are, you know, what are people wearing these days? Oh yeah, they wear bells on their belt. Or there were pom-poms on their hat or tassels on their leggings. <laughs> it's so great. I love little things like that, little touches. There are various entrances, right? So there's a cave outside of town. So that's one way of coming into this level of the dungeon is from outside of the town itself. But then there are crypts that lead down from room six and eight. There's the sewer, the hole in the ceiling, which leads up to the sewer, which is room 12. And then there is um, the, the tomb, which is uh, from room nine on level two. So there are various ways of getting down to this floor. And, and actually that one continues on past the fourth level. Here you have the Maggot Queen, the Man Maggots, that continues on from the from floor above. above. You have a Basilisk, and you have uh, some youths and bodyguards as a subject of a local cult. You have Fumo the Grey Ape, and then of course you have the Skull of Malabranch itself, which is uh, very, very interesting. Uh, it's powerful, it can speak to you. You can tear out his canine tooth to serve as a dagger plus one. Those cut by it must save or else crave to be cut again. Very creepy. <laughs> um, and he can teach you magic spells. So if you do have a wizard who is okay dealing with a devil, maybe more like a warlock, right? I guess in your campaign, if that's the sort of campaign you're running, then you could easily throw that in here. But I really like how things are interconnected, right? You basically have these different biomes, or at least in this one you have a couple biomes that connect to different, um, yeah, to just they connect to different things. They connect to different um, entrances and therefore different ways of uh, approaching this. You wouldn't have to do this all as one big dungeon crawl, right? You could have um, an adventure where the players have to go find these youths, and so they go outside the city. And as they find their way to the cave, they make their way back under the city and they realize, hey, we're under the city. We're connecting to other parts that we could connect to elsewhere. I think that's really cool. I like that sort of thing. So then we have level four, the Great Cavern, right? We're getting lower and lower and lower. We're getting less and less connected to um, uh, the sewers themselves. Now we're dealing with troglodytes and ooze folk and cave crickets and giant rats. 
Um, one of the people down here is Princess Euphemia, or Euphemia. She was kidnapped as a child 20 years ago to serve as queen of the Troglodytes. She now rules as best she can, waging war on the Ooze folk and raiding the surface world. So there's this human uh, princess who was kidnapped, and she's the daughter of the king. And so there's a huge reward for her, I believe. Um, it's mentioned somewhere, or maybe you could make there be a big reward for any information about it. I mean, just 20 years, it's a long time. But that would be a whole thing, right, is that there's a... You realize that, hey, the, the, the princess is down here. Um, you also get the uh, side uh, crypt, right? And that just connects from uh, from B, goes down to 8, 9, 10, and 11. Um, and I don't think, yeah, there's no real way to go past this. So that's the end of this offshoot. But that's cool. It just goes down to level 4. You have a little side, a little few rooms, a room of swords, which is really cool. Um, yeah, so you have Night Wand, which is a chaotic, intelligent longsword plus two with the following abilities. and cast darkness, and you have dark vision. But if any other sword is drawn from the earth, all of the swords rise and fight as flying swords. Um, that's really cool. That's really cool. And there's a lot of treasure down there, too. There's 3,000 gold pieces behind a trapped chest and some giant spiders, or a giant spider. And then there's also a mithril shirt and a cloak of elvenkind down here in the crypt. So lots of great stuff to run into. And then you can go down further, which is the Hexumvirate, which is a cabal of wizards who have established themselves here. Um, and you have different entrances, of course, down to this level, and you have cave crabs and shadows, and the wizard study itself, and a portal. Um, it leads to a wizard's tower. That's all it says, right? So that would be another adventure for you to develop. You'd have to develop a wizard's tower. There are plenty of wizard's towers out there you could do. Maybe it's somewhere in the city. Maybe it's somewhere outside the city. Maybe it's across the world. Um, but that's what you'd have. Um, and, and again, you have entrances. The portal can be entered from elsewhere. So you can come in and out from the portal. You could make it a whole um, thing, right? And uh, in here also the wizard study. There's another portal that uh, in room 5 that allows access to Aradia's tower. So there's another portal that can take you to another wizard's tower. <laughs> right? There's just lots of places that this could connect to in your world. And I think that's really, really cool. Uh, you have three mistakes. <laughs> that's horrible. Bizarre-looking creatures that are trapped and be able to attack through the bars. One of the kennels holds nothing but twisted bones. You have a couple mistakes in there. So these are wizards trying these weird experiments and... Not so good. Probably where the ooze folk came from, I would imagine. But maybe, maybe not. The house with no doors. Right? So there's only one way, which is up if you go all the way to uh, room 2 in level 5. Or um, the waterfall in room 1, level 5. So you can go back up two ways down here. Either through the waterfall or through the steps in the temple. You get psychic leeches down here. Animal-headed skeleton. That's pretty awful. Psychic toads. A troll. This is great, right? A great little end to everything here. And then there's a house with no doors. Um, very strange. The building here is made of ancient wood coated with mineral deposits that have dripped from the ceiling above. It has no doors or windows. Inside, on an inverted tree stump, is a huge nugget of quartz and gold weighing 650 pounds and worth 10,000 gold pieces. 1d6 days after the nugget is broken or just removed from the dungeon, an earthquake will destroy the city and collapse the dungeon. Wow. That's really cool, but, you know, you got to be real, real, real careful. <laughs> um, you've got the Wishing Ulm. An underground lake fills this cavern fed by a roaring waterfall. A ledge juts out from the falls 20 feet up. The water is frigid. Anyone fully submerged must save or go into shock. In the deep black water, there is a single ulm, a blind pink salamander as long as a man's forearm. It will hide so long as the troll is a threat. Once a year, the ulm can bite off a human finger and grant a single wish as the wish spell. Selfish or destructive wishes are more likely to be misinterpreted, while altruistic wishes will be granted as requested. That's great! And including a wish or the ability to get a wish in an adventure is not something we see very much because wishes are very powerful. So, you gotta be careful. Lastly, there's an appendices, or a set of appendix, a pen of appendices. Yeah, you have Appendix A, places in the city, which is cool, right? Things that would connect to this. You have the ruins outside the city walls and ways of connecting. Um, and rumors that are kind of connected there, or at least some sort of rumors there. People in the city, important people that are mentioned here. City events that have that connect to things down here. And then other things. Right? There's a, the city was founded on an even older site dedicated to a primordial god in the form of an enormous gold nugget. The god still protects the city, and the city will be destroyed without the god's protection. 
there's an exotic animal fad going on right now, and there are wizards' towers um, in and around the city. So you have stuff that you need to know to run this adventure, but simple enough. I really like this, man. I think this is a fantastic document. I think this is a great thing. I, I, you know, again, this is one of those things I wish more people would make things like this. I love how the I love how it's all one pages. I love how um, the the maps are really interconnected. The the stuff that's going on here is is fun. You could run this in a city campaign, and you'd have a lot of a lot of fun. So, highly recommend under the city. Uh, and again, it's pay what you want. So throw a couple dollars uh, to Simon Simon's way because I think this is this is definitely worth it. The next one is the Great Dwarf Road. This is another awesome, awesome set of uh, pages, and it's very much like the other one. You have the same sorts of ideas. One pages for locations with rumors, encounters, and then the actual places there. And essentially, it's a big dwarven road through the mountains, right? You're thinking Moria or something from, um, what's that first episode of, uh, um, oh no, I can't remember the name of it. The Record of Lotus War, right? Whereas they're going through that old dwarven road and there's the dragon beneath it. it those sorts of things, right? which itself I'm sure was based on Moria. Um, so you have just some pretty... I don't know, pretty awesome rooms. you got some harpies. You're going through a man-legged centipede, which is nasty. Um, yeah, that's really cool. We have men-at-arms, uh, and you have dwarven spirits. Um, and then, of course, the uh, bandits, right? That's the kind of idea, is that there are bandits running up here. I, I think they're bandits. I mean, I would imagine they're sort of men-at-arms ruled by the bastard. Um, yeah, now reduced to banditry. Once a popular claim into the throne... Now he's reduced to banditry, and he has his loyal bannermen. He seeks alliances and ambitions, but he's paranoid and obsessed with imagined traitors and spies. But he's got a thousand gold, so if you found your way to where he is uh, over by eight and nine, uh, well, then you'd have to deal with him. Lots of really cool encounters. You'd, you'd enter towards it. You'd have to find your way through the main gates. There's the harpies that would block you off there. There are um, some centipedes in the halls beyond. You're dealing with dwarven spirits down in the tombs. You got a cool cylinder trap over by 5A, a rolling cylinder trap. And then you got these bandits, and then you can move on. There are several ways to move forward, right? You can go A or B as you move on. And that takes you to the Shrine of Grudges, right? A takes you on the main path, B takes you down those side roads. And those side roads might be safer, might be more dangerous. Um, this is the way that you proceed forward. I really like this. There are these things called infested down here. They're real gross. Um, human survivors of a previous expedition along the road, they are infested with a parasite from drinking the water at two, which you don't want to drink. Um, they are the, these compel them to seek new victims to infect. They're sweaty and intense, fighting with hysterical strength and scavenged dwarf tools. The infested attempt to capture uninfested using force or guile. When the victim is helpless, a larva hatches, uh, killing the infested and injects the, worm, the victim with an egg. The egg hatches into a worm bride after one month. Sounds so gross. <laughs> so gross, right? Uh, just foul. Now we don't, I don't know what a worm bride is. Oh, here's it in room eight. Uh, yeah, it's nasty. Five tentacles. Um, it's got armor as male. Yeah. Bone white tentacles trailing lacy feelers like a bridal veil. If she was killed, the water at two clears. Ugh. Foul. But really creepy and really cool. So you can go through the road and just try to, you know, just run through. It doesn't seem like there's any reason to not just run through, but there are lots of side tunnels here. And so, again, you guys could pause, you could stop, you could make this as long or as short as you want, right? There's no idea here for how long this section or how big each of these rooms are. That's up to you to kind of figure out. So maybe this is a huge section of the road. Maybe this is very short, right? This Dwarven Road could be something you pass through in a day. It could be something you pass through in a week. However long you want to do this, I think you could easily make this, um, you, you know, fit this to your system and your, your table of choice. I think that's really cool. Um, there's also an interesting here, thing here, the Shrine of Grudges, which is what this area is named after. A stylized representation of a dwarf carved from stone, chipped and scarred by hundreds of blows. Any dwarf will recognize this as a consecrated Shrine of Grudges. Strike the statue, say the name of one who has wronged you, and the oath is complete. You earn 50% less XP from all sources until the named enemy is killed, banished, or imprisoned, at which time you earn 500 XP per enemy hit die. Dwarves earn double this bonus. If you reconcile with the one named, or if you name someone who has not wronged you, you are subject to a curse. Your beard and hair fall out. Any group you are in suffers a minus two penalty on reaction rolls. Minus four for dwarves reactions. Oof. 
But that's kind of an interesting idea. You could be seeking out, maybe you're seeking out the last known shrine of grudges. Maybe that's one of the reasons you're coming here. Because some dwarf's like, I'm going to do it. I have to do it. Maybe it's a part of the dwarven culture uh, in your world. Who knows? But that's kind of cool. And you get the broken bridge. Right? Now this is going to be a stop. You can't just cross this broken cavern. Uh, it's a gap 25 feet wide at its narrowest point. The edge is unstable and crumbling. Fall is 60 feet. So you can't just go to one side and just get across. Now maybe you can. Maybe your group has a way of just skipping. But if it doesn't, then you're going to have to go down. You're going to have to go down and go around, right, and find your way to the other side, um, uh, probably up through four, uh, you know, that side over there. But maybe not. Maybe you just find another way up. Still, you're going to have to find some way of connecting. And there's a lot of stuff going on here. There's some ogres. There's a goblin village, the Throne of Eyes, which is really cool. A swing bridge <laughs> with 2d10 goblins and a uh, fry who is um, an ogre, I believe. Yeah, hugely fat. Fry eats goblins who disobey him. Uh, it's really interesting because you have... Um, the o ogres and the goblins are kind of a faction. They're bullying them. So maybe the ogres could be turned on. Maybe the goblins could be turned on. Or the, could be, you know, some goblins could be you know, convinced to, to switch sides to the, uh, on the ogres. Because there's Boil, Grill, and Fry, which is great names for ogres. I love that. Um, and then you get the Parliament of Clans, which is more of the deeper section of the dwarves. You have a cool lava bridge, very, very hot. The Battlefield of Ghosts, 143 warring specters. That's so cool. I love that idea. There's just this massive battlefield uh, where um, the dwarves are just going at it, two clans. Uh, claw, bite, and grapple amidst their own skeletal remains. They turn on any newcomers with equal ferocity, so you got to be very careful. You don't want to engage 143 specters. Right? They'll, they'll wreck you, almost regardless of your level. Um, and you've got some dwarven ghosts down here, some earth elementals. So this is relatively high level, right? I mean, you're talking eight hit dice thing. You're talking 143 specters. The last section was 2d10 goblins that it could attack. So you're looking at a little bit of, of difficulty here, but you're looking at also some pretty high rewards. You have fireproof gauntlets, which sounds really cool. The horn of worms and the kern of earthquakes, which are two extra items now found in the uh, uh, appendix here. And uh, yeah, it's just really cool. Really cool what you're dealing with here. The piggery, you've got wear swine. That's awesome. Um, I think that's that's great. Um, a slaughterhouse of disobedient square shrine. Ooh, this is so gross. But then you have uh, the green slime down here. You have a hot pool, which is cool. Soaking for 30 minutes, access to cure disease, and restores 2d6 hit points. That's great. Um, but non-dwarves have to do a con check. You get some silver mines here. And then you have Ilyanka's lair. A great hero slew a dragon that once lived in these mountains. The dwarf necromancer Bone Beard was imprisoned by his kin. The dragon, Ilyanka. There's a dragon down here. Ten hit dice. You gotta be very, very, very careful. There's a hero's sword lodged beneath the scales of her left flank, creating a festering abscess. Ugh. And she will spare anyone who promises to unlock the gate and let her free. That's pretty cool. You don't just have to fight. There's also an old wizard, Bone Beard, um, or Necromancer. You got some cultists <laughs> carrying a willing sacrifice towards the Griffin Eerie. That's awesome. Really cool. Ad Adventures with dragons are always nice, because after all, we don't play with dragons enough. Then you have the Griffin Eerie, which is all awesome. I think that's really cool. And you have the North Gate, which is shut fast and locked. The great gouges are clawed into the iron stone and is pitted with this scorched acid. The mechanism is too heavy to be picked by conventional means, although custom tools might do the job. Unlock the doors lead to a gentle, uh, open to a gentle touch. Outside the gate, a mountain pass leads down a narrow pass. So that's the exit right there. But you've got to find a way through. You've got to find a way out through this power, you know, these, these doors. And you've got the Eerie up there at the top, which is really cool too. Griffin Eerie, feral griffins up there. You want to be very, very careful. But you get some griffin eggs and griffin chicks. So you can definitely go and get those. Those would be valuable. Maybe you could get them and sell them and train them or whatever. Um, a cult of degenerate dwarves. Pretty awful. <laughs> Pretty awful. The abject. 
than yeah, these crazy dwarves. Now maybe your whole goal is to get griffin eggs, in which case you have to come all the way down here. Um, but maybe not. Then you get the uh, appendices, which is a south gate to the Shrine of Grudges. Um, you have some encounters if you want to make that. It's about three miles or an hour's walk, so there is a you know, suggested length of how far it is between these different locations, and you have some encounters on the road. Um, there's the appendices of tombs, so if you want to add in some more tombs, that's pretty cool. Uh, Shrine of Grudges to the Broken Bridge, how far that is, and the random encounters there. Encounters on the road and how far you have just as a glance what they all are. You have the appendices, uh, appendix of caves, you have a broken bridge, department of clans, all that stuff with encounters, stuff you can run into. Um, and th what I really like about them is that they're usually, um, they're usually, uh, well, I would say um, they help make the next section more interesting. They help make it more, uh, you have more reasons to engage with the people there, the creatures there, or the, the things there. So you run into one of these, I would, I would make sure that the players run into some of these things in between. And the same thing going on. You have more random encounters. And then you have the magic items at the very back. And then some of them are really cool. The, the lich breeches, the vampiric trousers. <laughs> this horrifying pair of leather breeches was created from the skin of a rival wizard. The wearer's con introduced by one point due to the trousers blood drinking. The wearer cannot cross running water, and the trousers are destroyed if exposed to bright sunlight. At will, the wearer is able to transform into a large bat or to assume a gaseous form. The trousers retain a rudimentary consciousness and long for final death. It's so weird. But I love that. Uh, the current of earthquakes, a pair of dark stone discs as for grinding grain carved with runes. Activating its magic requires grinding within the current rocks or soil from the region you wish to affect, along with the gemstones worth at least a thousand gold. After a full eight hours of grinding, a devastating earthquake strikes the desired region. Super powerful, and I like these sorts of magic items. There are some cool magic items that are just like, hey, this is a great sword, it's a plus two sword, and now uh, you can re-roll failed morale checks. I like those sorts of magic items too, but then there are these really powerful things like the current of earthquakes which is really really tricky and would be campaign changing you don't like a you don't like a city huh devastating earthquake wrecks it you don't like the enemy army devastating earthquake wrecks it like this is a this is a campaign level item right i like that sort of thing that's the whole pdf 11 pages uh but really cool as you guys can see i think this is awesome uh, people don't know about these things they really need to again download this pay what you want and uh, give them some money for this because this is another fantastic offering all right the final uh, one i want to cover really quickly is pyramid of the undying as i said before this is a fan edit of uh, moldvay's the lost city but it's set in our world and it has some of the more D, &D stuff re reduced and he has his notes here on what he changed um so he says he removed the lower levels and rewrote the history of the pyramid to fit that um, uh, move the setting to the medieval early modern earth or remove some D &D ism such as evil humanoids and some other monsters edit the text and layout for easier reference change so treasure to silver standard and slightly reduce the amount of treasure expanded information on joining each of the factions and made minor adjustments to the maps and some encounters for tighter themes and more varied paths so I think that's interesting. Keep it a little bit more varied up. You can see the, the maps are presented frequently. You get descriptions of each of the rooms. This whole thing is um, hyperlinked, so you can go to any particular room if it's mentioned here. Uh, uh, let's see, I'm trying to find another one on the page. You don't really, can't really see one. But whenever you see those sorts of uh, underlined um, sections, you can you can go to wherever it's, it's supposed to take you. Sometimes it leads you to a different room. Yeah, here we go, to room 24A, for example, is hyperlinked. That's cool. You have the Brotherhood of Zeus, you have the the Chambers of the Magi, you have the, the Maidens of the Daughters of Athena, and then you have this, the followers of Zargon, four factions more or less, although Zargon's pretty much just bad. The other three, the Magi of Hermes are pretty bad too, or he's pretty bad, uh, Arga. But the other, uh, the Warrior Women of Athena, the Brotherhood of Zeus, they're both decent factions you could join. Um, you can join any of the four, actually, and there are benefits for joining all four, but most parties are probably not going to join the cultists of Sargon, I would imagine. Um, but what you get is, is a very standard, I would say, dungeon crawl in that there are monsters, traps, um, treasure, puzzles, but very simple puzzles. They're not really, really complex. It's not a puzzle dungeon. And then the faction play is there if the players want it, um, where you can join this faction against that faction and try to organize this. But it seems really cool. I mean, as a, as a pretty standard, old school, you know, sensibilities from an older era of D&D, &D, right? And I wouldn't say it's, it's definitely not in the, um, it's not in the sort of 
OSR Renaissance style, right? Uh, it's not sort of like the, uh, you're not looking at the sorts of dungeons that you're going to see in the new old school Essentials dungeons uh, with Gavin Norman or anything like that. Um, you're looking at much more classic D&D &D dungeon design here. Uh, lots of curving hallways that don't seem like they go anywhere sometimes, right? Uh, lots of questions that the players might have, like, how are things alive here? How is, how is there air down here? Um, but there's at least a, a sort of a general idea given that there is this, this cult, or the spell was cast of preservation. It's just why everything's in here. And it's an evil preservation. It kind of preserves them in madness, and their madness and their horrible nightmares and dreams feed the... The, the, the old god Zargon. Um, so it's not good, but that sort of explains how things are alive down here. So if your players are really bothered by it, and some players are, you know, I have a player who really is bothered by funhouse dungeon design, nonsensical hallways, uh, you know, architecture that doesn't make sense, things that can't, you know, well, how is this here? How is it? There's like, you know, one room where there are two white apes just in this crypt. And you're like, why are they here? How, how are they here? How are they alive here? Um, that sort of question is going to bother some players. It's not going to bother others at all. So you know, know your table. But uh, I think if you're if you have a table that isn't bothered by that sort of thing, or at least that they're willing to overlook it if the adventure is cool enough, then this is a great adventure because there's a lot of cool stuff here. There's one really weird encounter with doppelgangers. I'm not sure. I haven't again. I haven't seen the the Forgotten City, so I don't know if this is actually in there and this is just a re redoing of that. But there's this weird like you fight the doppelgangers and then you take out your names out of a bowl and if. If later on, if the two players are alone, you, you look at the two sheets, and if either of them is a doppelganger, then they have to fight. And then you're just a, a doppelganger, or your character is a doppelganger, or the other one can now become one, and it's like, you just lose your character. <laughs> so that's something that a lot of players wouldn't like. But, you know, know your table, and if you're in that old-school mentality of just like, yep, now you're a doppelganger. Sweet. Okay. Um, but there's, there, you know, it, while there is, it is supposed to be more like our world, you can see there's gelatinous cubes down here, and there's um, giants and were-rats. And so it's definitely in the fantasy thing. It's not just like a historical adventure. Um, but it is, uh, it is trying to be more um, historical fantasy than just straight fantasy. And you get the followers of Sargon. You get an appendix for the uh, Synodesians and the different encounters you can have there. These are the people who inhabit the place. And then you get a map fragment, which is something you give to the players. It's something you can find in one of the uh, dungeons. It gives you a, a clue about where to go in the dungeon. So this is 14 pages, a, a, a brief rundown of a very big adventure as far as I know, or at least a, a much bigger adventure. Again, a fan edit, something that's been cut down. It's been, um, you know, compressed a bit. And I think it's, it's a great adventure. I, if I, you know, I, if I didn't know that it was any connection to the Lost City by Moldve, I would just think, oh, this is a great adventure. This is a fantastic adventure. I'm not sure. On the one hand, I, I don't have any comparison to the other one, but I think that also is a good thing because I don't have the comparison in my mind. I'm just looking at this as a, as an adventure on its own right, and I think it's great. So, if you're interested in a pyramid, an old pyramid with factions and lots of treasure and a good old classic D and D dungeon romp through a, you know. <laughs> an ancient pyramid, then this is a great one. And again, it's pay what you want on drive through RPG. So if you do end up running it, um, you know, give them a couple bucks at least. All right, guys. Well, that is it for this video. I have the Pyramid of the Undying, the Great Dwarf Road, and Under the City, all by Simon Carrier. I'll put links below to where you can get them. Uh, all right, guys. I hope this has been interesting, and I'll see you all in another video.